Hey, hello, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Stan Osterman, and I don't know where to say I'm from anymore. I'm just retired now. I'll just say I'm, I'm retired from Kailua and a concerned citizen and energy guru. Yeah, I like the guru part. Anyway, thanks for joining us today here on Think Tech Hawaii, where we try and bring you the latest and the best things, all things energy uh, for the community to get up to speed. Today, we have a special guest coming to us uh, from the state uh, government. From DBED to be specific, uh, Ryan Hamadon. Um, he's here from uh, the GEMS office, which uh, I had Gwen Yamamoto Lau come in um, a couple, what, seven, eight months ago and talk to us about the GEMS program, which is a great program. And I'll, I'll let Ryan kind of describe what it's all about. And uh, but first of all, Ryan, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the GEMS. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations on your retirement. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're going to enjoy it and make good use of your time now. So far, I'm enjoying it. Sounds good. Uh, like Stan mentioned, I am the senior program officer at the GEMS program. Uh, we are actually part of the Hawaii Green Infrastructure Authority. And I've been with the program for about almost going on, coming up on two years. My background is in the finance industry. I've worked at various banks here mm -hmm. uh, in Honolulu. So that's where my I guess, strength lies when I was hired and as I uh, worked on a job, I acquired the knowledge about energy and had to you know, quickly uh, learn about the ins and outs of the uh, solar industry here. So with the help of uh, the various stakeholders that we interact with, the contractors, talking to clients, talking to the nonprofits and the energy associations, you know, I built up my knowledge and you know, I tried to contribute where I can to make the program successful. Great. <laughs> So tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about the background of GEMS mm -hmm. and how it got started, what the intent was, mm -hmm. and uh, so we can kind of fill people in on the program itself. Sure. Uh, quick background. So this program was created about five years ago, and the program was part of the whole uh, state's initiative to be 100% renewable by 2045. But the state realized that in order to do that, there are certain sectors uh, in our islands that are considered underserved or hard to reach, and mm -hmm. they may need um, assistance in achieving uh, green energy. So uh, recognizing that, the state uh, loaded a bond, the legislature authorized a bond issue uh, to fund a program targeting these hard to reach sectors, and those were defined on the consumer side as low to moderate income households, and on the commercial side, the uh, underserved were defined as nonprofits, multifamily properties and small businesses. So hopefully you know, with the creation of the program we were um, tasked with reaching out to those sectors and helping them you know, achieve green energy. So the mm -hmm. initial bond was mm -hmm. for like 500,000? Uh, 150 million dollars oh. actually. Yeah. Okay, correct. Yeah. It was pretty uh -huh. substantial. It was, it was. And you know there was a lot of um, uh, expectations when it first was mm -hmm. issued to quickly get the money out and uh, the agency, our agency did get some flack at the very beginning for not uh, dispersing the money quick enough. Um, there were a lot of changes going on during that time when the bond was issued. Um, them disappeared, number of solar contractors uh, decreased from 300 plus right. down, I think now we're probably less than 100 I think, you know. So there were some challenges that the program faced, but I think the uh, the model and the programs that we created that we are imp imp implementing now really have helped um, achieve that goal of getting the money out efficiently and to the right people. So mm -hmm. what was the actual process at the beginning? Because um, I want you to talk about the changes. But in the beginning, mm -hmm. if, if say I was um, an underserved, mm -hmm. you know, multifamily dwelling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wanted to apply for this funding, mm -hmm. how would that process look? What would it look like? Back then, yeah. Uh, back then, basically, you would come to the um, come to our agency, um, submit your proposal application, and the uh, agency will be tasked with determining first of all, are you an eligible mm -hmm. uh, participant in our program, and secondly, does the proposed installation um, achieve a savings goal, both energy wise and financially? Okay. So that was a challenge. Okay, mm -hmm. and then so assuming you pass those wickets, mm -hmm. you qualify. Mm -hmm. It's a worthwhile project. Mm -hmm. Um, then how does the money actually get to the individual mm -hmm. and what were the terms of repayment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the criteria to qualify the program haven't, hasn't really changed. It, it remains the same because it's set in the regulation, the guidelines set forth by the PUC. Um, the method of getting the money out did evolve and 
Uh, but once you do qualify for the program, you are an eligible uh, applicant, and your project does meet the guidelines, then our agency works with the contractor in making sure that it gets installed properly and that end product is resulting in what they set out to do, which is to save money and save energy for the off for the nonprofit, for the homeowner, for the um, multifamily business. And, and so did it, uh, did it usually entail like a power purchase agreement where the contractor would pay off, mm -hmm. uh, pay back the, the money to the state or the homeowner mm -hmm. or would it, could it flex either way? Or? Yeah, so we were able to craft a program where we can, we were flexible enough to accommodate these power purchase agreements because um, as people in the uh, solar industry know, for a lot of nonprofits, it's difficult for them to get into, um, uh, it's, for them to install EV systems, Sometimes it's financially difficult right. because of the lack of tax credits available to nonprofits. If they don't pay taxes, so how do they um, reap the benefits of the tax credits that are out there on the federal and state side? So one of the ways are, is through power purchase agreements. We devise a way to finance the investors who own the who are uh, own the PV system, which are the creators of the PPA, financing their project and making sure that the agreements that the um, the agreement between the off-taker and the PPA owner, that it is benefiting the nonprofit, the end user. Okay. Our, our uh, underwriting makes sure that there is a tangible benefit, both energy and financially, for the off -taker. You also mentioned in there that one of the changes that happened as Jim came mm -hmm. on board that kind of was an inhibitor mm -hmm. was um, NEM. Mm -hmm. um, and that's net energy metering. Correct. That's a Hawaiian electric thing, mm -hmm. PUC Hawaiian mm -hmm. electric where um, people could sell back electricity yes. basically to the electric company. Yes. Um, what overall impact mm -hmm. have you seen mm -hmm. because of NEM going away? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. on a large scale, not just mm -hmm. for GEM, but as an energy thing. Mm -hmm. Has it been a, a real big um, negative to see mm -hmm. that go away? Or? It's been with, the, um, with NEM sunsetting, it's been more, I guess, more of a challenge to achieve the financial savings on that part. Um, mm -hmm. The NEM program was very generous in the way that they credited the homeowners of the businesses for the energy that was sent back to the grid. Um, the, the interconnection agreements available now are not as generous. Um, the way it's set up is you know, the energy that is purchased back from the utility by the off-taker, by the ratepayer, is not at full retail price. Yeah. So the benefit, cost benefit back to the, uh, the rate payer um, is a little more challenging to achieve that. Yeah. But we, you know, we try to accommodate that issue also in our underwriting and our approval process. Yeah. Well. Is there any been, been any really dramatic changes since the early days and now with um, how your system mm -hmm. works? You said that the qualifications mm -hmm. is basically the same mm -hmm. and the criteria is yeah. kind of the same. But I know it's expanded a little bit, the Correct. definitions. Correct. Uh, the biggest change to our program, and we, we've seen a large spike in applications because of it, is we finally got to launch our on-bill repayment program for our GEMS program. It's been in the works for a number of years, and we finally got, uh, got it approved and implemented thanks to the work of the PUC, the legislator, the legislator and uh, Hawaii Electric in Im implementing our on-bill program. Can you describe the on sure. program a little? So the on program allows us to uh, further reach out to um, certain sectors who may not have access to traditional tax credits. So that's mm. one of the goals of our program was to make the uh, green energy financing available to more people. Uh, but a lot of people encounter problems getting financed for whatever reason. Uh, you go to a traditional bank, they rely on credit scores, right. cash flow, uh, income to determine qualifications for loans. But with our on bill program is we look at the potential savings that the rate payer, the applicant, will achieve post-installation. That savings we will use to repay the gem obligation. What's a typical yeah. savings that you see happening mm -hmm. because of that? Well, to get approved, the uh, project must uh, achieve a minimum 10% saving, okay. including the repayment cost of our gem obligation. We look at their historical uh, utility bill, and we say, let's say homeowner A has been paying $500 a month for utility costs. Uh, the way our program is, we'll look at the um, repayment history for that homeowner. 
because they've been paying that $500 average utility bill on time for the past 12 months. They've received no disconnect notices from the utility, then they're eligible to apply for a program. Um, once they get pre-approved, you know, they're an eligible applicant, then you take a look at the project itself. Does it achieve savings for the rate payer? And we look at that savings and we define it as if their bill is 500, averaging $500 a month, pre-installation, post-installation, we kind of estimate what their new utility cost, utility bill will look like. Let's just say for discussion that it turns out to be $300 a month. They're able to reduce their utility consumption down to $300 a month. But now they have this added cost of repaying our loan. Let's say that adds $100 a month to there. We add the $300, our $100 program mm -hmm. charge to repay it. Now their total out-of-pocket utility cost is $400. We compare $400 post-installation, $500 pre-installation. If there's at least a 10% savings, gap right there, then we can approve the system. Okay. I know too that um, initially the GEMS program was kind of focused just on the PV installation itself, mm -hmm. but somewhere along the way um, storage became um, a factor as well. Can, right. you, can you talk about, because that, that, mm -hmm. that's a big difference too, because yes. you have storage uh, in terms of batteries mm -hmm. to back up your mm -hmm. PV, which is mm -hmm. a lot more, I think, practical for mm -hmm. the average mm -hmm. household. Mm -hmm. The, if a lot of people don't understand, if you just have PV on your roof mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you're connected to the grid and the grid goes down, you don't have any power mm -hmm. because ECO can't allow power to come back into the grid and back feed the grid if they got people working on the lines. So basically your PV is cut off as long as you're connected mm -hmm. to the grid. Mm -hmm. But when you add storage to the PV, mm -hmm. now you have a system that can disconnect from the mm -hmm. grid and operate autonomously and come back. So that storage piece is kind mm -hmm. of critical to Talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. I'm talking to a lot of the contractors now, and a lot of the systems do incorporate batteries, um, um, and some of them do require batteries. So at this present moment, our program is we're unable to finance batteries. When the okay. program was created back you know, five years ago, mm -hmm. batteries were not an approved technology for the use of our product. So one of our goals is, and we've, you know, again, this is feedback from our um, our contractors. customers and the contractors saying, yeah, a lot of times batteries are required to achieve the saving. So we're looking at ways to perhaps um, modify a program to allow battery financing, or perhaps if you have other sources of funding outside of our present uh, GEMS bond, mm -hmm. which prohibits batteries, if we get a, another source of funding for our program, then perhaps we can lend on batteries. So the energy storage yeah. piece is mm -hmm. some, something I talked to Gwen about yeah. a long time mm -hmm. ago. You're still working on that. With Correct. Them. That would require so. mm -hmm. PUC or legislation or both? It would uh, require approval uh, by the PUC okay. to use our current GEMS bonds money. But like I said, you know, we are um, when is actively looking at different sources of funding for our program. Um, there's been, she just recently came back from a conference on the mainland, a uh, National Green Bank, mm. uh, get together a conference on the East Coast. And there has been legislation um, introduced on the congressional level, on the federal level, to establish a green bank, sort of like a Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. one for a green energy project, where uh, agencies like ours can borrow money at a low cost from this central green bank, and then re-lend it out um, to programs like the GEMS program. Okay. So that's kind of, um, that's been introduced, uh, hasn't been passed yet on the congressional level, but you know, there are supporters of that idea. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break mm -hmm. here, and we'll come back and mm -hmm. uh, talk more to Ryan about uh, what's going on in GEMS now, and uh, maybe even look at um, how the program has changed and what they're looking for. Thanks to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Munley and the Friends of ThinkTech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Duane Carisu, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, 
Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. Hey, welcome back to Stand the Energy Man here on another just downright gorgeous Friday, a law Friday as we see in Hawaii. Um, and we're talking to um, Ryan Hamadon um, from the GEMS program, which is a great program that's trying to help underserved communities in our state to develop clean energy projects to reduce their fossil fuel footprint and, uh, and help reach that um, 2045 clean energy goal that the state has set for the well, Ryan, you know, we, we talked a little bit about how the program started. I know one of the challenges early on was um, a lot of the smaller investors or the smaller projects um, were, were kind of slowing things down or, or it just didn't seem like you couldn't get momentum. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that has been improved or, or what we're working on to improve that? Yeah, I believe when the program first started, and I wasn't quite around, but I did hear about the program when it first started you know, about five years ago. But from my understanding is that a lot of the lending criteria and lending requirements were not as flexible uh, to accommodate uh, the different types of projects that were coming in and seeking GEMS financing. Our challenge, I think, recently was to how do we accommodate a variety of uh, project types, a variety of different investors who have different needs, who have different requirements, how do we accommodate them while still adhering to the basic program guidelines? I think we came up with a pretty good um, way of handling the commercial and residential applications that come in. And you know, helping them, in, in the end, we want to get the money out and help these people install their uh, energy efficient uh, renewable systems. So we definitely came up with a plan, I think, and uh, procedures to uh, efficiently go through these applications, ensure that the savings uh, is there, and, you know, and bringing everybody closer to uh, the state's energy can you say that, um, that Lorraine just, or no, Gwen just yes. went to the mainland? Yes. Um, to this Green Bank? Green uh, Bank Conference, correct, on the East Coast. And what's, yeah. what's mm -hmm. the kind of gist of that in, in terms of how mm -hmm. would it affect Hawaii? Well, definitely, like I touched upon, you know, that, 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 that could be another source of funds for us outside of our current GEMS bond. You know, we could definitely draw upon that because the way our GEMS bond is structured, it's not a revolving account. Mm -hmm. Basically, once the money is dispersed and repaid, we're not allowed to relend the money. The money that's paid back is returned back to the PUC. So if it, there is a definite end date to the funds that we have in place. But because of the success that our program has had in the past few years, the contractor is asking, what's going to happen when the money runs out? Right. Are we going to have access to more money? You know, so that's the challenge that we're having is to finding either through uh, more appropriations from the legislature, perhaps, or other sources of funds, like I mentioned, to possibly if the Green Bank program does get off the ground, that could be a So what, as we look forward here in Hawaii with um, what we have in terms of our bond and things like that, what are some of the things that your office is looking to do with the legislature and the PUC um, to expand the program or to make it, um, uh, maybe somebody has a wind project or something yeah. that's mm -hmm. not solar, um, to, a, to mm -hmm. a, adapt those mm -hmm. technologies or mm -hmm. different criteria, or maybe even larger, um, not let's say underserved, but mm -hmm. maybe more marginally served. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're not really they don't meet that, that criteria that you mm -hmm. initially set, mm -hmm. but maybe you know, just above them, uh, mm -hmm. it's still kind of tough to do. I mean, mm -hmm. even for a uh, medium family uh, income, it's it's mm -hmm. tough to install as the incentives start to go away, mm -hmm. the net metering goes away. Um, mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you folks are looking at in the future? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we're always in discussion every year uh, about how we can enhance our program, expand our program. Um, like I mentioned to you, one of the challenges of our program is that our uh, GEMS bond fund is a depleting fund. Eventually, the money will run out. So one of our goals is to find alternate sources of funding. And you know, we are working with the legislators to find out what's the best way to um, add money to our program, to extend it past its um, end date, whenever it may be, when the money does run out. We definitely are, are working with um, key legislators you know, to craft the bills that would um, allow this program to live on past its 
joined them. So the, the program's about five years old. Right. And so that, that bond has mm -hmm. been out there for five yes. years or so. And you have a, an end date out in the future where you, you got a kind of a target where you have to have future funding lined up. Yeah, so right now of the $150 million, we've committed about $90 million of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so right now we have about, I would say, $30, $32 million left to lend. So we're not quite in that critical level yet, but we do have to consider that um, the money is not going to be there for us. You know? so we definitely are looking for ways to expand, uh, expand the program. So if, if it's a bond mm -hmm. then, um, and you've got, 90, so you've got mm -hmm. like two thirds of mm -hmm. it loaned out mm -hmm. right now. The part that's not loaned out, mm -hmm. um, are those, have those bonds actually been sold and are, are people expecting a return on investment? Yeah, so we have been paying interest on the bonds okay. since it's been issued and all of that. So okay. part of the repayment is from the, uh, the uh, interest on the bond is being paid through the repayment of our loans mm -hmm. of the fund that we lend out. So that was always, it was critical to get the program off as quickly right. as we could. Um, there was a delay at, at first, but now I think we've got some good momentum. You know, we are looking um, at the success of our on bill program, um, definitely drawing upon that. We had a big influx of applications, especially on the residential side, ever since this on bill program was launched. And we're very, you know, thankful for the work that everybody put into in this program. And just to mention, the, on the national level, um, um, we have been recognized for this on bill program. I believe like we're probably, I think, the first in the nation to have this type of financing available. Um, and people were impressed by it because it's the ability to be inclusive and comprehensive. So I think it's uh, something that we should be proud of. Uh, yeah. you, it surprised yeah. me when you said there was yeah. $90 million out now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's a huge improvement. Well, committed, committed, yeah. yeah. These um, PV projects, especially on the commercial side, they're construction projects. Right. So they go in stages and steps and all mm -hmm. that. So we don't necessarily disperse the full cost right. uh, up front, you know, but, but that's it still is committed. A, a big, it is committed, big, uh, yes. improvement over it when is. the program started. Correct. It was kind of just slow rolling for a long yes. time, and mm -hmm. I know that the people who, mm -hmm. who had the bonds out there are going, hey, wait a minute, we're, <laughs> we're not loaning any money out, but we have uh -huh. to pay mm -hmm. interest on these bonds. Correct. And, and the challenge is, you know, we do have to balance the needs. You know, we need, needed to get the money out, money out as quickly as possible, but we have to ensure that the money that is out there will be repaid. Right. You know, so this kind of fine balancing of, you know, we're not a grant program. We're not there right. just to give out money. We have to have some level of assurance some that risk it'll be paid back. Correct, there. correct. Yeah. But with the on bill program, because the obligation is placed on bill, on the utility bill, we can kind of ensure that, yes, we will get paid back. So generally, right. people, when they pay their monthly bills, electricity is usually on the, near right. the top of the list, yeah. you know. So knowing that they'll pay their utility bill, which includes our loan repayment, we're pretty much assured that you know, we should get repaid over. Okay. Are there any specific um, pieces of legislation that um, your office is kind of looking where you need public support, you need public help from, or any, mm -hmm. any uh, dockets at the PUC that um, you'd like to kind of solicit you know, public help, testimony, mm -hmm. or contractors help from the construction side? Uh, we're still in the early stages of crafting our um, proposals for the next legislative session. We just got through with our 2019 session, you know. Um, but we are um, probably looking at, um, definitely looking at uh, different funding sources, perhaps to consider more money you know, for our program. Um, but it's always tough asking for it's more tough. money from it's the legislature. It's going to get tougher, you know? trust Yeah, me. yeah, any, any program. But I think, you know, we've shown a level of success over the past few years that I think we can stand behind. So uh, we're hoping that they will listen to us. Um, but then again, we can't just rely on the state. So like I mentioned, we're looking for other sources outside of the state to help supplement uh, our current pool of funds. So I'm just gonna ask you an opinion yes. question now. It's not necessarily GEMS yes. related, but you know, we've, we've come up with our 2045 goal mm -hmm. to be uh, clean energy mm -hmm. on our grid. And there's equally aggressive uh, um, movement to clean our transportation sector up mm -hmm. and, and get it probably electrified. Mm -hmm. um, do you see Hawaii meeting that 2045 goal? I mean, the, the players that are involved, the PUC, mm -hmm. the electric company, mm -hmm. the transportation sector, Power Hawaii, the mm -hmm. oil refineries, do you, do you see Hawaii gas, do you see all of mm -hmm. the players kind of coming up with strategic plans mm -hmm. that, that are encouraging to you that 
that you know maybe your program can help fund in, in other yeah. areas? No, I definitely. I think there is a overall desire to uh, to get to that point, um, but and it definitely will take uh, working together of the public and private sector to get it done. But I'm sure everyone knows the government can't do it by themselves, mm -hmm. and. Um, the private sector probably needs help from the government as far as regulation or permitting or that kind of thing in order to get um, to get their projects done and all that. So it definitely has to be a meeting of the minds. Um, I do think it's achievable. Um, it's going to take a lot of patience, a lot of um, hard work, a lot of sweat equity to put into it to make it happen. Um, but I think it is possible. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, and I think people, they, they kind of see yeah. solar energy as free energy. <laughs> you know, and, and it's like it, it may be. In fact, mm -hmm. I anticipate that the uh, utility bills will start to go, actually go down mm -hmm. as we move towards clean energy. The problem mm -hmm. is the infrastructure we're using mm -hmm. was built over the last hundred years and mm -hmm. paid for over the last hundred mm -hmm. years. And you can't just replace that overnight right. for free. Right. So there is mm -hmm. going to be an upfront mm -hmm. investment to get us mm -hmm. there. And I think my fear is that, mm -hmm. that some of the players involved either aren't anticipating mm -hmm. that bill up front or the legislature mm -hmm. and the government aren't in a position to really mm -hmm. help it. Mm -hmm. Like you said, the, the GEMS program was designed to give some folks a leg up and get them started because mm -hmm. the startup costs are expensive. They are. And, and I think mm -hmm. we need to kind of look at that mm -hmm. same concept mm -hmm. on a larger scale, maybe across the, the entire spectrum of, of, uh, of income and, and income mm -hmm. levels. Mm -hmm that we get everybody moving to help the infrastructure move forward. Yeah, there's no doubt that the initial upfront cost for a lot of these projects is high. But if you look at the long-term benefit of expending the money upfront, it should, in the long run, pay off. Yes. Right? And that's the kind of the hurdle that uh, we have to get over, I guess. Um, I'm sure the younger generation has that force, um, that, that um, site to look past just the initial one, two, three, four, five years to say, yeah, 10, 15, 20 years, it's going to be worth it, you know. I think uh, a lot of it would, would rely on the next generation, I guess, to help convince us older folks, maybe, you mm -hmm. know, that it is a worthwhile investment at this time for the future benefit. One of the, the power purchase yeah. agreements mm -hmm. is one of the ways that people are trying to mm -hmm. avoid absorbing that cost mm -hmm. themselves up front. Um, are, are they still pretty popular? They still are. You know, the tax credits are still out there for the investors. These investors are their business people. and They see the benefit of having uh, the tax credit on the federal and on the state side, helping them uh, themselves. So I think um, uh, there is still a definite uh, appetite for these types of agreements out there. And uh, one thing that is kind of um, spurring that along recently is the sunsetting of the federal renewable tax credit. You know, so that kind of incentivized a lot of these investors to get together and get projects off the ground before the end of the year does come 2021, 2022, the amount of federal tax credits available will start lessening that thing in this box. All right, well, thanks, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being on the show today. All right. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for bringing us up to speed on what the state and Thank you are doing. Glad with to be here. And uh, mm -hmm. we'll have to have you back in another couple months and see if we can get the PUC to open their aperture a little bit. <laughs> we'll and do our get best. some more folks included in your That's program. Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Stan. Thanks for joining us today on Think Tech and Stan Energy Man, and I'll see you next Friday on Think Tech on the 16th floor of the Pioneer Plaza. Aloha.